Uh, so that'd be great. Now, our Father, we thank you this evening just for the great opportunity once again to open your word, for you to searchlight our hearts with its truth, and for you to renew our minds that we might be shaped and more conformed into the image of your Son. We know that this life is temporal, it's short. You said it appears for a moment and then vanishes away. It's like our breath on a cold day, your word teaches in comparison to all of eternity. And yet you have taught us that the way we invest this small slice of time will determine our reward in eternity future. And so we want to be wise and good stewards. Thank you that you don't put us under pressure, that you simply ask us to yield to the Spirit of God who fills us and directs us in conjunction with the truth of Scripture. And so tonight uh, we want our thoughts to be conformed after yours because your ways are not like our ways and your thoughts are not like ours. And we'll give you all the praise and the thanks in Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, let me just briefly review where we've been because we've been out of sync with this lesson for a few weeks. Uh, the theme is developing an eternal perspective. That is to say, how do you live in light of eternity? Uh, this handout will be approximately 65 pages by the time we're finished, and it will be available for full printout in its entirety when we're done. But again, each week, if you miss a lesson, go online, you can print it out, and you can listen uh, online to the message for that week. Roman number one, we simply looked at the shortness of life. That again, we're like a vapor that appears for a moment and then is gone. And that really keeps us humble. It keeps us dependent on the Lord. Then we saw that we need to think with an eternal outlook. That was Roman numeral two. And we saw that while there is a judgment for sin, for the lost people, it's called the great white throne judgment, there is a different kind of judgment for Christians. And most Christians, I shouldn't say all but many, uh, think that there's no judgment for them because there are many passages that affirm there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus that we've passed out of judgment into life. But it's a different judgment. It's called tabematos. We translate that the bema seat. The bema seat is often referred to as the judgment of the just. It's a judgment only for Christians in which God will evaluate the service that he has done through us, again, in conjunction with his word. And that's why we said it was so important that we be spirit-filled people because God asks us to yield, but the spirit can only direct us and take us in terms of what we've learned in his word. And if we're lazy or sloppy or don't care, apathetic, lukewarm, then that renewal process will not march forward and we won't live in light of eternity. So that is a judgment for service. And again, as we'll see before we're all done, this is for the glory of God. That brought us to Roman numeral three. And that's this section of the course, this handout that we're in right now. And we saw that Roman numeral three, if you, some of you have big notebooks, but it's, um, we need to invest in eternity by living with an eternal outlook. And so the first point under that is that God will evaluate what we do for him. So that's where we are. We're, we're trying to live with an eternal outlook. Well, what determines something that's of eternal value? First, we need to do those things that God calls us to do. And he's gonna evaluate how we did with those things. And so number one, we saw that God will reward his people for the way that we treat others. And we went through great discourse on that. Then number two was, God will reward us for how we use our gifts in his church. We're not talking about natural talents or even acquired skills, though certainly I have no doubt God will evaluate the whole package someday. But those things often dovetail with our spiritual gifts. And so when the Bible speaks of gifts, it's not speaking of natural talents and acquired skills that unsaved people might have. It's speaking specifically to one of those gifts that God gave you on your spiritual birthday. You say, I don't even know what they are. Well, this is why we need to study God's word and learn what it says, because like the police say, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Ignorance of the scripture is no excuse. God expects us to learn his word and to conform to it. 
And so if you're not sure what your spiritual gift is, you might want to take the spiritual gifts course online, maybe even the test at searchthescriptures.org. You have at least one spiritual gift. Number three, we saw we know that God will reward his people for the work that we've done. And a large section of our life is earning a living or being a worker at home. If you're a mother, that's a large section of how you spend your life. If you're a dad and you're out in the workplace, does that have eternal value? Of course it does. Whatever you do, do your work heartily for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance. It's the Lord Christ whom you serve. And so how we do our work with excellence for the glory of God, serving the Lord and not men, that will be evaluated. Someone came up to me after the last session where we covered that, and they said, you did a whole theology of work. And I said, I did. I said, we went through a large portion of Scripture and what it says about work, but shouldn't we? Because work is how we will spend a big portion of our life. That brings us to number four, where we're at tonight there in your um, note-taking outline. We know that God will reward his people for how we use our money. Point four, how we use our money. So, by way of introduction, by comparison to other subjects God addresses, money is a major theme in the Bible in that there are about 500 verses on prayer, about 500 verses on faith, and yet there are over 2,000 verses on the subject of money. So while the subject of stewardship in the Bible is used in different realms of life, basic to any theology of stewardship is recognizing that all we have is from God. Now, I know when we hear the word stewardship, we often think, well, the church wants our money or it's time for the annual pledge card, as many churches do. But stewardship is a much broader word, and we'll explore that in a little more depth in our next time together. But basic to stewardship, whether it's of your spiritual gifts or elders who shepherd the church or whatever it might be, how you use your money, is that it's not our time, it's God's time, it's not our money, it's the Lord's. And so King David will write here in that trilogy of Psalms, Psalm 23, 20, 22, 23, and 24 is a great trilogy. 22 deals with the crucifixion, 23 with um, his, his crook, so to speak, his care for us. Most of us have Psalm 23 memorized and Psalm 24 with his future coronation. So they're written together by King David and the 24th Psalm opens, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. Think about just that one verse. If God owns it all, then biblically speaking, we're just stewards. And so we're not surprised that the Bible tells us that one way we will be evaluated is by the manner in which we managed his money. In our financial course, uh, the very first section deals with the subject of stewardship. And I encourage people to go home if they've never done this formally, at least in their mind or heart. And there's even a document that they can sign between them and God where they acknowledge everything that they own is not theirs, but God's. And if we don't see that, we'll never be happy people. We'll be habitually frustrated, worried, concerned, or potentially greedy. God owns it all. It's his money. We should not be surprised by this, that, it's, that he owns it all, that it's all his, that money is important. Why? Because Jesus taught our spiritual temperature can often be taken by the attitude we have towards our money and our possessions. Certainly, Jesus affirmed that truth, did he not? In Matthew 6, 21, where a man's treasure is, there will his heart be also. Um, turn to Luke chapter 12 for just a moment. Luke chapter 12. It's an interesting portion of Scripture. We'll camp here for a few minutes. Um, Jesus in this uh, chapter is addressing the multitudes, and he's dealing with a number of subjects. Uh, the chapter opens where he addresses the subject of hypocrisy. Uh, hypocritos means literally a play actor. You know, in the Greek tragedies, they would change masks, right? And, um, and so the, the very term comes from someone who is a play actor, but in the spiritual realm. 
And so he says in 12.1, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And so leaven is used in different ways in Scripture, but one principal way in which it illustrates life is as something that's sinful. And so at Passover, which the Jews are moving towards this week, all the leaven in a home is, is removed because it represents sin. Uh, and he reminds us there's nothing covered up that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be made known. Uh, then he deals in verse 4, for instance, with the subject of persecution. I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and go after that, and, and after that, that have no more that they can do. But I warn you, I have memorized this in different translation. My mind wants to run a different direction. I, but I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one after whom, <laughs> fear the one who after he has killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. And so he, he's dealing with the fact that you will be persecuted. Now, most of the persecution that's highlighted in Scripture is verbal in nature, and we studied that recently in a Sunday morning message. But in some parts of the world, it's physical. And you should pray for our missionaries in India, especially in the northern tier. Uh, the elders have 50 new people. We're reading through, I haven't read through all their applications yet but we're reading through them in preparation for our next elders meeting. And as best I can tell, every single one of them looks qualified, but some of them are working in very difficult places. And the kind of things that Hamas did on October the 7th is happening to Indian believers in India. Uh, so persecution is a fact of life. So he's talking about hell, fear God. He talks about worry. Look at verse seven, the very hairs of your head are numbered. Uh, he, he speaks about, um, look at uh, verse 10, and everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. I mean, my, talk about important subjects. Now, back here on your handout for a second. Um, again, I just want to set that in your mind. On one occasion, it's recorded in Luke chapter 12 when Jesus was teaching the multitudes about hypocrisy, hell, worry, and persecution, and about an, an eternal sin, for which, by the way, there is no forgiveness, as Matthew underscores. It's an unforgivable sin, known as blasphemy against the Spirit. There was a man plagued with thoughts of money. You know, therefore, how deep the problem is. Jesus is talking about some very serious stuff. And all he can think about is money. Someone in the crowd, verse 13 here, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? Then he said to them, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. These two brothers who are fighting over the family inheritance, and by the way, how many families have you witnessed that have been divided over some family inheritance? I've had a lot of counseling in the last three decades in this church of people who have come in because some, someone at the top of the family died and they're trying to deal with a brother or a sister or someone who's battling over things. So it's not a new problem. They're fighting over the family inheritance with one brother trying to publicly embarrass the other. But Jesus' response to his request for counsel was a clear man who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you. Now, it's not that Jesus is not concerned about justice, he is. But what this man doesn't recognize is that covetousness is a much, much bigger problem. Point seven, going all the way back to the days of Moses, when God had Moses assisted by the 70 elders of Israel. By the way, the Sanhedrin was reconstituted just a few years ago in Israel, which again, I think is interesting in light of the prophetic schedule and what that will mean someday for a rebuilt temple. But most would date the uh, 70 elders of Israel in the New Testament known as the council, or in some of our Bibles, the Sanhedrin. 
Some Bibles it's transliterated and other Bibles it's interpreted, but it's the same entity that it would go back to Jethro when Moses, if you remember, was overwhelmed from morning to evening. And his wise father-in-law came along and said, you, you need to delegate. You select some wise men and they deal with all the problems by tribes and families and the ones they can't solve, they bring to you. That became a more formalized group and so they're discussed as such in Exodus 24. So when God had Moses assisted by the 70 elders of Israel, continuing in that tradition, rabbis were expected to solve problems. But on this day, Jesus refused to help. By the way, that is still a common mindset. If you know, at least in the Orthodox realm, rabbis, they are expected to solve problems. And so when there's a major problem, they don't go to a counselor, they don't go to legal authorities, they go to the rabbis. Jesus knew that to simply divide the family inheritance would not solve their real problem, for he knew their real problem was covetousness. In both of their hearts, as the word you, who appointed me an arbiter over you, and you there is plural meaning you too, and the original here in verse 14, it's plural. So he's dealing not just with the brother who asks the question, he's dealing with both brothers. These two brothers are like many people today who want Jesus for what he can do for them. They want him to serve them, but they do not want him to save them. And the words, what, of 2 Corinthians eleven four, 4, Paul speaks of those who come along and they preach another Jesus. And there are many preachers today, they're preaching Jesus, they're using the language of historic Christianity but if you pull back the veneer of their theology, it's clear they're not preaching the Jesus of the New Testament, another Jesus. But sadly, because the church is so undertaught, and this has been the evil one's strategy to get Bible teaching out of the church, they can't discern the difference. But 10, Jesus made it clear that he came first to save people. And then he reveals that the problem this man raises is the fruit of his fallen sinful nature. And so like a good physician, he chooses to treat the disease rather than the symptom. The disease was that both brothers were suffering from greed as seen in the fact that the man who had kept his brother's share was very greedy. And the man who had lost his share was also greedy because he could think of nothing else. (laughs) So they both got a problem, a huge problem. So notice what Jesus said. Then he said to them, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. So Jesus' counsel here is the exact opposite of what the world typically embraces because without the second birth, people tend to measure a man's life by what he owns. I mean, that's what the world does. How successful is he? Well, 13, people are usually classified as rich or as poor, as successful or as unsuccessful, as a power broker or as a peon by the size and value of the possessions they own. Isn't that pretty much it? I mean, that's the way folks think. Now, someone might be very successful in this world, but in God's eyes, a total failure. Someone might be very poor, but an extreme success. Or you could have both in both categories. However, lest we as Christians become boastful that this could never infect us, when we come down to verse 22, which will be there in a minute, Jesus applies his teaching to all his true followers. And so, spiritually speaking, the parable that follows is not simply what Jesus is saying to the lost, or for that matter, even to these two brothers, as much as it is what he is saying to those who believe. And if you miss that, you will fail to apply his teaching to your life. And it's easy to miss that. He's not talking about me. He's talking about someone else but he's gonna make it clear he's talking to every true born again 
blood by a child of God. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones and there I will store my grain and my goods. Here was a farmer who was so skilled and so blessed of God that he had a problem resulting from his success. He had such he had such a great he had such great bumper crops that he could not store all of his grain or his goods and this was causing him much concern so he made a very bold decision instead of adding on he tore down his existing barns and built bigger and better ones in order to store all his grain in his goods. Someone asked me last time what the blue words meant. Blue is all scripture. Just if you're new to the Bible, that's a fair question. All the words in the handout in blue are directly from the text. In order to store all his grain and his goods, and all the while his thoughts were far away from God. And that's what can happen. Isn't that what Jesus said, or, or what well, the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 22 that the greatest of all the commandments in Scripture was the Shema. And of course, after you read Deuteronomy 6, Shema, hear, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. A few chapters later, God says, look, when you get into the land and you inherit houses that you didn't build and you enjoy cisterns that you didn't dig and on the list goes, don't forget me. And that's what happens. And so we are in a generation of people who have inherited much from our forefathers. When you look back 200 years in the life of the average American, comparatively speaking, to today, we have much. And in the process, we've been enamored by the much, and we have forgotten God. And so notice what he says in verse 19. In the parable, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. In many ways, he's like a lot of people today trying to earn a college degree or to hone some craft or skill in order to land the best job, to make the most money, so that they might have a fat lifestyle in an early and easy retirement. I like that word fat. I wanted to put that in there. I hope it's not offensive to you. I'm using it metaphorically. A fat lifestyle, all right? But Jesus did not see this farmer as enjoying life, but he saw him as facing death. Oh, what a different perspective. Dying had never entered this man's mind. All that he had worked so very hard to earn and the lifestyle that he longed to enjoy, he had now achieved, but along the way, the thought of death never occurred to him. He reached his goal. You know, it's funny because when I worked with college students, and I did for over a decade, and sometimes if you tried to set up an appointment to talk to them about the single most important thing in life, Oh, I, I don't have time. You know, I got so many other things I got to do. And, and, you know, like these little things they have to do are more important than their soul. In my last two years with that organization, I was the director of executive ministries in Dallas, and I worked with the CEOs of major corporations, like the CEO of 7-Eleven, which there's not many of those around here, but they're in most parts of the country. And on, I could tell you, not to brag, Wyndham Hotels, et cetera. And some of these people were so consumed with their wealth, they didn't have time for God. And you don't have to have a lot to think that way. You can have, comparative to the super wealthy, little. But as we'll think about in just a moment, comparative to the rest of the world, everyone in this room is rich. You may not think of it that way, but it is true. It is true. So this man, number 21, right? This man was, who was consumed with this life only, on the very day he made his boast of retirement and ease, he died. 
God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and who will own what you have prepared? So the day he makes this boast is the day he dies. I think that's an interesting play that Jesus uses in this parable. And he was immediately confronted with the world he had ignored, and that world he would have to deal with for all eternity. That's sobering. The greatest tragedy is not what the man left to other people, but the fact that he lived without God and now he was dying without God because money was his God. Small g there, money was his God. His principal problem was that he was not rich toward God, which meant he was not acknowledging that everything that he owned came from God, right? Psalm 24.1 nor did he have any desire to use what God had given him for the good of others and for the honor of God. So while God has given us all things to enjoy, in fact, hold your finger here and go to 1 Timothy for a moment. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy 6, right after Gary eats popcorn you got all the T-books in the Bible, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, 1st Timothy chapter 6, just to give you some context on the flow of thought. In 6.10, he says, for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. Now, you know that's one of the more misquoted verses, right? It doesn't say the love of money. It doesn't say money is a root of all sorts of evil, but the love of money, agapao, it's a willful love. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But flee these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance with gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. And you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Uh, drop down to verse 17. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope in the uncertainty of riches, but in God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to, be, to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. And often in these passages that deal with the subject of money, God deals with the subject of eternal rewards. So he's writing to his people, but he's encouraging them to lay up this treasure in heaven to use Jesus' words. So uh, back here in the handout, um, 24, while God has given us all things to enjoy, we just read that. So if God gave you something, you don't have to make an excuse for it. Enjoy it if God gave it to you. <laughs> You don't have to say, well, I got it on sale. If God didn't want you to have it, it didn't matter whether you bought it on sale, right? But if he gave it to you, enjoy it. Well, God has given us all things to enjoy. To be rich towards God means that we are not simply consumed with our wants as this man was consumed with himself. Clearly seen in his use of the pronouns I and my some 10 times. So I went through that parable and I read it in the original and and they're emphatic, the pronouns, in a um, Greek verb. The person of the verb is contained, but when you want to underscore the, in other words, like you might have a word that will say, I run. But if you want to underscore and emphasize, you say, you put the pronoun I, I run. I, I run. It's emphatic. And so all the way through, Jesus is emphasizing this man's use of I am I in his own parable some 10 times. The pleasures that God gives us to enjoy must go together with our treasures above. And Paul taught this balance when he told Timothy to teach these principles. Again, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. And so here the phrase rich in this present world puts it all into perspective in that there are some who might be rich now, but they must use their riches responsibly if they will be rich in the age to come. For one can be rich now and poor later, right? So 
Of course, and of course, the principle applies to those with seemingly little. And that as they lay up treasures in heaven, they might be poor in this life, but rich in the next. And so, again, instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future. Paul is using the same verbiage that Jesus gives in the Sermon on the Mount. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth that moth and rust destroy and so on, but treasures in heaven, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. So he's talking about experiencing real life now. And when we are not a TLO person, a this life only person, but we're thinking in light of eternity, then we really find this abundant life that Christ speaks of. Now, believers, number 20 in America, who reason that this instruction is only for the rich and famous, have not stopped to consider that by the living standards of the rest of the world, most Christians living in America today are indeed wealthy stewards. We really are. We're really wealthy stewards. Even the person, number 29, even the person who has concluded, I wish being rich was my problem, <laughs> may well be showing his spirit of greed, which all of us can fall into as Jesus warns in Luke chapter 12. It's not ours, it's the Lord's. I think of that rebuke that Moses gave, I think it's in Deuteronomy 8, he says, listen, it is the Lord your God who gave you the ability to make wealth. So any money that you have, God gave you the ability to make it. It didn't originate with you. And so you can't say, well, no, I worked hard for it. Yeah, you may have, and you should work hard. Do your work heartily as in the Lord rather than for men. And some people bring a lot of trouble on themselves for the simple reason they don't have a work ethic. And that's the problem with really Generation Z and the Alpha generation that's coming up. They don't have a work ethic. They just don't have, they do not know how to sweat. Uh, I won't go there, but um, <laughs> being a giver, number 30, being a giver and giving consistently on the first day of the week. By the way, that's when the church met. Someone came up to me at the extravaganza and they said, why do you meet on Sunday? I said, because the church men met on the first day of the week. Now, I don't know if this gentleman was from Europe, he had an accent, but in Western Europe and in Eastern Europe, the first day of the week is not Sunday, it's Monday. And so when you look at their calendars, and so Sunday is considered the seventh day of the week on their calendars, the way they format them. And it's more of a secular mindset. Now the communists did that by design. Victor can tell you, you look at any Ukrainian calendar and it doesn't start, you know, uh, Sunday through Saturday. It starts on a different play because they wanted to obliterate this whole concept of even worshiping God. But nonetheless, the church met on the first day of the week. And so Paul in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 says, when you gather in the first day of the week, that's when you set aside your money. When they met on the first day of the week, Acts 20, verse 12, to do what? To break bread, because that's the day they worshiped. Why? Because God has changed. No, God never changes, but sometimes the way he deals with his people changes. Someone asked me, do I think all 10 commandments are applicable? Yes, all 10, except that the Sabbath, the new covenant Sabbath is the Lord's day. We will go back, the scripture teaches in Ezekiel and a number of Old Testament prophets during the millennial reign of the Messiah, and we will worship again on Saturday. But right now, we worship on Sunday as instructed by the Lord. But here's the point. Being a giver and giving consistently on the first day of the week, as God dictates, is God's built-in protection to guard our hearts from materialism and from worry and from trusting in the uncertainty of riches instead of in Him. Sadly, those who have relegated tithing or the giving of 10% of one's income as legalistic and as an Old Testament practice with no application for today, missed that God instituted tithing ever before he gave the law. So you'll meet some Christians, they'll say, well, that's a legalistic Old Testament, Old Testament mosaic command and it doesn't apply to us. 
Well, actually, tithing is practiced ever before the Mosaic law is given. The first example of tithing that we find is in Genesis 14, where it says, he, Abraham, gave a tenth of all that he had to him, him, Melchizedek. Of course, Melchizedek, people debate over who he is as a person as they read Hebrews 7, because he's described as having no genealogy, no beginning or end. Um, I don't think he was a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ, but I think he's a type of Christ. And that because his genealogy is not listed with a beginning or an end, uh, in that sense, he's like an eternal person. He's not saying he's an eternal person. Lay that aside. They underscore in the New Testament in passages like Hebrews 7, and I gave you the text here, yes, 7, 1 through 5, of giving a tenth to Melchizedek. So tithing is practiced ever before the law is given. And I think by design, because it being part of God's moral law and it being something that you did habitually on the Sabbath or under the new covenant on the first day of the week as God prospers you. And so he prospers people differently and so their tithe, their 10% will be different. But it's a constant reminder that it's his. And sadly in churches that do not teach tithing, you think they have over 300 missionaries like this church has? People are blown away when they come to this church and they realize how many missionaries we support. These 25 new couples, 50 new missionaries, and then we have another 25 applications coming in a few more months. Will those be budgeted? No, they're never budgeted. We don't budget any of these missionaries. It becomes an issue, does God want us to support them? And if he does, we take them on in faith and we've never been short. (laughs) There's no human rationale behind it. It's the hand of God. But churches that don't teach tithing, the people are often consumed by greed, by covetousness. They're not thinking about eternal values. Those churches don't grow by conversion other than biological conversions within their own families because they're inwardly focused. And again, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So God has a reason for this, and it's for our good. Christ commanded uh, commended the tithe in Matthew 23, 23. He placed it alongside of justice and mercy and faithfulness. In fact, it's also recorded in in Luke, but I'm just going to read to you Matthew 23, 23. Again, it's that great steaming sermon of woes to scribes and Pharisees who are hypocrites. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrite. If you tithe mint and dill and cumin, those are spices. Oh, we got a little spice bush here and there's 20 mint leaves. I, I'll give two to the Lord. I mean, that's, they, they got down to the mint and the cumin and, and the dill, but you've neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these things justice and mercy and faithfulness, you should have done without neglecting the others. You you should have tithed without neglecting the others because it's all part of God's moral law. So you find Abraham commencing tithing. He's the first one to do it. Jacob continues it. Moses will codify it and command it. Jesus will commend it here, so you shouldn't cancel it. And so before you just flippantly say, Tithing has no application for today. Just keep in mind what Matthew 5 and verse 19 says. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. These are Jesus' words. Now, if you're absolutely convinced because you've done a thorough and complete study that tithing has no application for today. Fine, but I'm telling you, you're not in sync with the rest of church history. And if you're just flippantly say, oh, that's just an Old Testament practice, doesn't apply today. You teach someone to break the least of these commandments and you'll be called least in the coming kingdom. It doesn't mean you're excluded. We're saved by grace. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 
So 33, God has us give so as to guard us from a spirit of greed and to remind us that all that, he, that we have is not ours but God's who richly supplies our needs, right? God shall supply all of our needs according to his riches in Christ, Philippians 4. None of the church fathers, not a one, show me one, there's not any. You can't find a single church father. These are the men who wrote commentaries after the apostles died. Much of their works have never been even translated, but of all that are translated, none of the church fathers taught that tithing no longer applied, much less any of the Protestant reformers, all the Protestant reformers taught tithing was applicable. In fact, the unanimous voice of the body of Christ for the first 1900 years of church history is that tithing is for today. Look, I have respect for C.I. Schofield and that he had a commitment to study the Bible, but he should never have been a pastor. He wasn't qualified because the pastor must be the husband of one wife. But he was the first one who basically said tithing has no application for today. And because he did it in a format that made owning your own study Bible popular for the first time, I think that false doctrine spread. Anyway, while our tithe sizes may be different because we prospered differently, again, Paul says, lay aside as each one is prospered, whether we consider ourselves rich or poor because we give as God prospers, we can witness just how faithful and just God is in taking care of us. Whether a person makes $1,000 a week or $10,000 a week, when each gives 10% or so moved in offering above the tithe, so it's not simply an issue of percentages, you know, 90% is mine, 10% is God's, it's all God's, right? Psalm 24.1. But the place to start is the tithe, and sometimes it's above the tithe if God so moves the human heart. Everyone is equal in God's eyes. The guy who tithes off of a thousand or ten thousand, everyone, or or the child who tithes off of a dollar that they earn. Everyone is equal in God's eyes, and both can lay up just as much treasure in eternity future. God's means of giving keeps everything just and fair in his economy of giving. So each of us must ask the question from the parable Jesus gives here in Luke 12, 16 to 21, is my heart fixed on the transient things of earth or on God's kingdom? When our hearts are fixed on the eternal, then God's peace will guard our minds and our hearts. Right, Philippians 4. And we will experience internal freedom. Jesus said to those who are questioning his lordship, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples. In other words, how do we tell the, the converted disciples? Because the word disciple, as you know, can be used in different contexts. It typically refers to someone who's just a learner. That's what the word mafetes means, a learner. And so not everyone who learned from Jesus was converted to Jesus. But sometimes it's used specifically of a believer. Uh, in uh, Acts 19, Paul will meet some disciples of John, but they were not yet converted, right? So again, context is everything. But Jesus said the mark of a true disciple is when they're converted, they continue in the word. Their, their, their life has changed. And then he said, you will know the truth the truth will set you free. When Jesus teaches us that not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions, he's not denying that we have basic needs. However, Jesus wants us to understand that our worth is not measured by what we own down here. And so we must look at earth from heaven's point of view because he knows that a fixation on transient things on earth will only produce worry. That's what it does. As, am I going too fast? You okay? All right. 42, as we studied earlier in this section of the course, there is nothing wrong with being a wise person in business or in even planning for the future. I mean, that's implied even in that section of Scripture that deals with money and those who are wealthy and the love of money and all the like. And he'll say, you know, honor widows who are widows indeed. 
And if someone has, if there's a widow who has children or grandchildren, they need to make return to their parents, to their grandparents. That's acceptable in the sight of God. So if a widow comes to the church and she's got children or grandchildren and she's looking to have the light bill paid because she's too embarrassed to ask for her kids, she's to go to her children first. That's, that's the order that God gives. And then he talks about who are true widows indeed that should be put on the list with no family at all. And he says, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and his own here in the context is not a dad looking down towards his kids. That's a legitimate application. But contextually, it's children and grandchildren looking up to their parents and their grandparents. If anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, He's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So you can't provide for your own if you don't have anything to provide them with. So God's not against you owning things. The problem with this farmer was that he had moved past saving to hoarding, such that his heart was captured by greed, or you could translate it in the King James, covetousness, instead of by God. By the way, the Pharisees did the same thing. Remember that rebuke Jesus gave in Mark 7, 11? I'll never forget it Um, (laughs) because my son used it on me once. And uh, in in Mark 7, 11, you know, we'd study God's word at night and one of them asked the question, and dad, what's Corbin? And I said, well, it's defined in the text. Look at the text. He says, if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I have that would help you is Corbin, it's dedicated to the Lord. A parent comes, a legitimate need. Sorry, Dad and Mom, this is dedicated to God. I can't help you with it. So I needed a dollar bill one day, and my son Jordan pulled out his wallet, and he put his hand over it, and he said, Corbin, <laughs> it's dedicated to the Lord. <laughs> and, uh, but again, God expects us to take care of our own. 44, while Jesus was not in favor of waste, as seen when he fed the 5,000, excluding women and children, and then asked to gather up the fragments so that nothing would be lost. And of course, he wanted to teach a bigger lesson. It's not by accident there were 12 baskets, one sitting at each of the apostles' feet. Neither did he support selfishness. God's assessment of this man was that he was a fool. You fool this night. Your soul is required of you. Because he was satisfied only with the things that money can buy. And when this happens to us, we will lose our eternal treasure that money cannot buy, and we will be full of worry. I'll fix that later. While unbelievers may be characterized by practicing the sin of covetousness, that's one of the marks right in 1 Corinthians 6, of someone who is excluded from the kingdom of God, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor nor, 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 covetous. That's on the list. And that's consistent, of course, with the parable of the sower. Some people never come to faith because they have covetous hearts. They're too consumed with the here and now and money. A believer can fall into this sin. And so Jesus now applies it to us. Look at verse 22. And he said to his disciples, for this reason, I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them how much more valuable you are than the birds." Certainly, Jesus was not teaching that we sit around and let God feed us, for even the birds for whom God cares have to go out and scratch for their worms, right? They still have to dig for them, but God provides. As we examined earlier, God expects us to trust him to supply while using our skills and abilities to work hard with the opportunities he supplies for us. And so we studied that a month or so ago. If a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. His point is, not if he can't, but if he won't. His point is, is that if God can do the lesser act, then he can do the greater act. Because if God feeds the birds, 
then he will certainly care and provide for his children. The problem is not that an omnipotent God is unable, but that we are unbelieving. That's the real problem. And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his lifespan? If then you cannot even do a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? Worry is all-consuming, and it blinds us to what God wants to do for us by faith. All the while we are thinking that worry accomplishes something, when in fact it cannot add a single hour, for worry typically makes our life shorter and not longer. Jesus connects greed and worry because greed can never get enough, while worry is afraid it will never have enough, and neither focus is looking to God who cares. Now there is a difference between a godly sense of responsibility and an ungodly worry that is not trusting. Though typically, worry usually masquerades itself as concern, doesn't it? I'm not worried, I'm just concerned. <laughs> right? We do that. The worry that Jesus is speaking about brings us down to the level of an animal who is merely concerned with physical needs when life is more than these basics. Worst of all, worry hinders our witness to those who are lost. For Jesus said, and do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink, and do not keep worrying. For all these things the nations, the ethnoi of the world eagerly seek. But your Father knows that you need these things. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Worry is what may characterize the nations, meaning the lost, the Gentiles, you could literally translate it, meaning the pagans. So don't pray like the Gentiles, meaning don't pray like the nations, like the pagans. But it is not to characterize those who are saved. For how can we encourage others to trust Christ for salvation if we do not practice our faith and trust in God for our, our everyday needs? And by the way, we won't want to encourage others to come to Christ. Why? Because we're consumed with our little, little, own little world. People who are consumed with worry aren't thinking about their lost next door neighbor typically. Worry is sin and it keeps us from growing. But if we seek his kingdom by serving the Lord in his local church and sharing Christ in our community and spending time alone with the Lord, then our perspective will change and worry will flee. It is when we only focus just on our business and our concerns that we worry. But when we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, it will dissolve in us. It's so true. It will dissolve away. You won't be captivated by it. Since life is more than the here and now, we should be concerned with eternal matters as we lay up treasure in heaven by pursuing the things above. Jesus concludes the parable by further applying to us when he states in verse 33, sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourself money belts which do not wear out and unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near nor moth destroys. This total commitment, and that's really what it is, a total commitment to generosity that Jesus speaks of has often raised the question, are we really called by Jesus to sell all our possessions? Remember, contextually, he's dealing with two covetous brothers who interrupted Jesus' sermon with the request to settle a dispute between he and his brother. That's the context. Now, he's applying it to believers, but that's the context, like with the rich young ruler. Go sell all that you possess, and then you'll have eternal life. Really? That's what you do to get into heaven? Well, if your money is God... You have to change who's going to be your God. What number are we on? 63. Jesus is speaking of the priority of investing in his kingdom. And Luke will make it clear in his second account, the book of Acts, that his command to sell and to give was not obsolete after Jesus' ascension as modeled in the early church, right? Acts 2. 
They were giving as anyone had need. Then a real super big need blossomed. And what did folks do? They followed Barnabas' example. He had a piece of land. It wasn't required. It wasn't socialism. It wasn't commanded. He sold a piece of land, brought the proceeds to the apostles' feet. Ah, So the needs could be met. It was a unique time. Nobody wanted to leave after this particular Pentecost. Two million folks. This was the first Pentecost where it was actually fulfilled in time and space. Everybody wanted to stay. This is what they had been waiting for for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and it happened. So, you know, vacation money ran out. Uh, your, your, your time in that city was exhausted. And so they gave as each had need. And of course, not Ananias to fire. They gave with the wrong motive. Jesus' point is that we must give up viewing what we call ours as if it were a private possession that we can hoard. And it must be totally available to God for it is all his. This provides an extravagant, counterintuitive correction to two covetous brothers. Let me finish, if you just stay with me, and I'll just pray at the end for time. I don't want to. These dear people, I hope you hug them and kiss them. You know, they're working with our kids in the nursery, and they do a phenomenal job. And, um, and they're saying, when is Pastor Brogy going to finish? Both the man who confronted Jesus for counsel and the rich farmer in the parable that he shares valued their possessions in order to build a kingdom here on earth. That's what they were doing. They were kingdom building, but in the wrong place. By contrast, those of us who are children of God should not be worried about the bare minimums needed to survive like food and clothing because God knows that knows what we need and he can provide for all our needs. I meet people who worry sometimes and they come in and And they've got an ulcer, and I said, well, you need to take the medicine, but that's just a Band-Aid because the root cause of the ulcer is your worry. But I will even ask those people, I said, have you ever missed a meal? And I've yet to hear one person say, no, I, I, I haven't had a meal in a week. We're talking about God's people now. You had a warm place to stay? I did. Well, if you got that, you're doing okay. You got to just kind of think and, you know, there's going to be some hard times coming into America. It's impossible not. You know, it took us, it had been taking us a year to hit a trillion dollars. Now we're hitting it every hundred days. We're adding a trillion dollars. It happened for the first time in a hundred days. And they say in the next hundred days, we're going to add another trillion dollars of debt. It's going to break. It's going to break. But what's the worst that can happen to you? You can die and go to heaven. And that ain't bad. (laughs) Earthly kingdoms are transient with no eternal value, a truth that did not seem to cross the mind of the covetous brother or the rich farmer. To quote Matthew 6.33, if we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, then God promises that all these things will be added to you implying that we would still own goods necessary to survive and to provide, but those goods would not own us. If we seek first his kingdom, then we will receive a far greater treasure in eternity that can never be stolen by theft or destroyed by decay or even taken by death. In Luke 12, 33, Jesus likens this to making money belts which do not wear out in contrast to the money belts of the day that had held temporal material wealth. People don't wear money belts much anymore, but it used to be when you traveled, first time I went to Europe in uh, 1973, my dad gave me a money belt. And, you know, I had a belt like this on, and then in the back there was a zipper, and that's where you stuck your money in, and you zipped it up. Well, they had something similar to that in in Jesus' day. That was a money belt, but not not like the one I wore, but still, (laughs) that's the concept. Um, Christ wants our priorities to be in the right place, such that we do not hold on too tight to this world's goods. Again, letting the Bible interpret itself, it is not wrong to own things, Otherwise, how could you covet? How could you be guilty of covetousness, right? If nobody owns anything, no one can commit the sin of covetousness because nobody owns anything. 
Or how can we take counsel from, learn a lesson from the ant, who in time of plenty stores up, so in time of need they'll have. Just so long as those things, again, do not own us. Jesus Christ wants us to value the things that he values that will outlive us and will continue on long after the entire planet has been burned with fire. Because that's the end point, right? The whole planet is gonna be burned. He'll make a new heaven and a new earth. And so we're not surprised that 16 of the 38 parables that Christ gave were concerned with how to handle the money and possessions entrusted to us. For he said, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus repeatedly discusses the heart when he refers to the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, right? The Beatitudes. Or when he teaches us about lust, a man lusts in his heart. And here he cautions about the direction of the heart. Now, while we do not see it in our English Bibles, in the original that the Spirit inspired, the word treasure actually appears twice when Christ gives the command not to store up treasures on earth. It literally reads, do not treasure up for yourselves treasures on the earth. In other words, stop treasuring treasure is the thought. Again, it's not a prohibition against being provident, but against being covetous. For Jesus to speak so much on the subject of material possessions we would do well to pay attention because his deep desire is for his people not to be distracted by things, but rather to value the souls of men over those possessions that we own. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? In the end, he forfeits his soul. Our Father, we thank you for the time that we have shared this evening, for your holy and infallible word. Thank you that you deal with us in grace, that this process of spiritual growth happens over an entire lifetime as we day by day, moment by moment, one step at a time, move in the direction by the Spirit's help that you'd want us to go. So help us to do that. Help us as we leave this place tonight to do some personal inventory and ask, what do you want to do, Lord? Where do you want to take me? We come and we intercede for these in need. Again, our deacon Sam Baragala, stuck in India, separated from his family. All the documents are in the official's hands. We pray that you give him favor and that you would give him release. We think, our Father, of this godless world that denies your existence and you as the creator. And this conference that you've entrusted to us later in the month for adults and college students and even kids in grammar school. Pray your blessing over that conference. That you would prepare Dave Penny and his team with all the skills that you've given them as MIT graduates, part of the space program, and and bless the presentation in a way that would challenge us. We thank you for this new soccer season that has been opened and the children that are coming, many who are unchurched. I pray especially for the parents who are there weekly that you would give wisdom when to speak, when not to speak, and that you would open up conversations, especially for these children who are unchurched. We want to thank you, Father, for giving us record attendance at our Easter services, and we thank you for those who came and those who had the Word of God planted in their hearts. We pray and ask that there would be much fruit that would come in the months ahead. We pray for Dr. Seth Postel as he leaves Israel in another day or so, that you would give him safety as he travels across the world. Thank you for his ministry to reach Jewish people with the gospel. Thank you for the incredible movement of the Spirit of God in that nation. With now tens of thousands of Jewish people calling Yeshua Lord. Equip him and bless him as he trains young men to be pastors in these many, many congregations across that nation. Be with us this Lord's Day, and if there's some Jewish person, Father, that you would want us to care for and reach between now and then. Show us that person that we might invite them. We'll give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.